Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 19. It says, Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Father, once again, we just treat your word, O oh Lord God, with reverence and respect. And we pray that you would speak to us, Lord God, this morning from your precious word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I titled my message this morning, Is There No Balm in Gilead? And I want you to know that there is hope for the sick. Amen. Amen. And, and, and before we get started good on the text, I just want to tell you that I always like to put a chronological uh, time frame on the board. And the reason that I do that is because I believe that geographically and chronologically it's very important that we gain a, a try to gain a mastery of these things. We're, we're here to learn the Bible. Amen? amen. We're not here just for the, the preacher to give me some new little relevant message and make me feel good about myself, pat me on the backside like they used to do in the football game and send me on my way home. No, we're here to study to show ourselves approved. Amen? Amen. The Lord's going to hold me accountable for a lot of things, and I pray that when I look into the eyes of my Redeemer, one thing that I would not have failed him in was trying my best to teach you the Word of God. If you're going to learn the Word of God, you're not just going to be able to hear it from me and expect to know it. You're going to have to go home, and you're going to have to read the Scriptures. I recommend that you just go ahead and pull your boots up, and that you start at Genesis 1-1, and you work your way all the way through. It's going to take you some time. Hallelujah. But just don't give up. Persevere. But listen, overall, the plan is this. God, you know, Adam is way back here. You know, in reality, if we went even further back, what we would find out is that there was an angelic rebellion that took place before man was formed from the, from the dirt, amen, of the earth, and life was breathed into him. An angelic rebellion took place, and in that angelic rebellion, you got to understand that that's when that war really began. In other words, that, that angel Lucifer who was created perfect in all of his ways and beauty was found in him until that day when iniquity was found in him, that was the first signal of war. War began at that point in time. And then whenever God created man of the dirt, the enemy was already there waiting. Waiting to interject himself into this prize creation that God had created, which was humanity. And so from that time moving forward, there was a period of time, really before even the flood, whenever things were so wicked upon the earth, and God judged the earth through a flood. And then through that, he brought us the, the family of Noah and his sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And then ultimately through Shem, we get Abraham. Abraham is such an important figure in, 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 in the biblical understanding of the ways of God because Abraham is the man that God called out of the world. There was no Israel at the time of Abraham. You understand that? There was no nation that belonged to God. There were only heathen nations. God called this man Abraham out and he promised that he would make him a nation. That he'd make him a people. And that through him, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And ultimately, I know I tell you this every week and I'm going to keep telling you. The Apostle Paul teaches us that it wasn't, that he said all nations of the earth would be blessed through your seed. And that it wasn't seeds as in plural as in the nation as a whole, but that ultimately what the nation would produce, which was one seed, and his name was Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so way back here, 2000 B.C., before Jesus ever shows up on the scene, God's already, he, his plan's already in effect. As a matter of fact, he says in 1 Peter 1.18 in the New Testament, he says that, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold. Redeemed means to be bought back. No, but instead with the precious blood of a lamb, which was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. Before God ever formed the earth, he already knew that the liar was going to be there. And he knew that the liar was going to get Adam to go his way. God already had a plan of redemption in place. Wherever you find yourself in your journey of Christianity, I can assure you God knows exactly where you are. He knows how to find you. Thank call you. upon his name. Amen. He's waiting for you and I to call upon him so that he can come to our rescue. But God created this. He pulled this man Abraham out and ultimately he made a nation out of them. 
It's a kind of a long story, and I don't want to go through it all. But in, 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 in Egypt, they found themselves in Egypt because of a famine in the land. Ultimately, they came out of the exodus, which means an exit. And they came out of the exodus as a mighty nation. Well, they probably made it. Maybe they didn't look like warriors at the time, but they had God on their side, and they came out a huge number, really a nation without a home, but God had promised them a land. And then finally they wandered for 40 years, but then ultimately under the leadership of Joshua, they came into the promised land. Then there was a time frame of the judges where they repeatedly went into failure, and they cheated on God, and then they would feel bad in their heart and cry out to God, and God would come and deliver them from the bondage of their enemy. I've told you many times, it sounds like my former walk with the Lord. And I hope that the Lord helped me because I certainly don't want to go back there. Amen. Amen. And, and, you know, and then from the time frame of the judges, finally, and, and I, was, I was going to turn to one of those scriptures this morning. They, they wanted a king because they wanted to be like the other nations. God had a plan for them, but they wanted a king. And for the last four weeks, it was about 100 years later that Elijah, the prophet, you remember that? He had that showdown with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and he called fire down from heaven. We spent four weeks talking about Elijah and, and the different stops that they went to. That was around this time here. But then because the people of God refused to listen to the prophets of God, ultimately they found themselves in Babylonian captivity. The same thing will happen to the Christian today. God will send warnings. He will send the truth to the people of God. And yet the people of God stiffen their neck and they harden their head and they harden their heart. They say, no, Lord, uh, I'm not really ready to do that yet. I think I'll just go ahead and go my own way. And before you know it, you can find yourself in a place of captivity where it's not really as easy to get out of as what you thought it was going to be to get out of. And what ended up happening was is that during that time frame, there was a prophet named Jeremiah. And I just wanted to tell you that that's where we are in all of this. We're in this time frame of captivity. Some of the people of Israel have been deported to Babylon. And some of the people are still in the city of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah is prophesying. And so here we are in this passage of scripture. And he says in verse 19, he asked the question, Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. What he's talking about is the people that have been departed. The daughter of his people are his children. And because of their disobedience, they find themselves in a foreign land. They've been taken captive by their enemy. But yet, the true child of God doesn't, is not happy when he finds himself deported and captive in a foreign land. The true child of God that has Jesus living on the inside of their hearts, whenever they realize that they're in the midst of bondage, there comes a time when they say, I don't want to live here anymore, Lord. I don't want to be in the midst of bondage. I'm tired of being deported. I want to be at the place where your presence dwells. And they begin to cry out. And whenever the true child of God begins to cry out, I'm telling you, God hears their cry. Yeah. Now, he doesn't always show up right at the time that we would expect him to. I don't know that we're going to preach it for sure next week, but I'm thinking maybe the Lord's leading me to preach on Lazarus come forth from the dead. And what you need to know is, is that sometimes the Lord doesn't show up right when you expect him to, Mary and Martha. He's got another plan because he sees things bigger than you do. And he knows how to get stuff done. Amen? Amen. And so here they are. They're crying out. They're tired of being in bondage. And it talks about because of them that dwell in a far country. It goes on to say, is not. See, it, it, God hears the cry of his people, but is not the Lord in Zion. Now, I wanted to go ahead and turn to... Um, to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. And that's one of the scriptures that I was telling you about. That after the time frame of the judges, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. This is one of the scriptures that I was telling you about. That after the time frame of the judges, the leadership of Israel began to cry out that they wanted a king. It says right here in chapter 8, I'll start at verse 1. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. They didn't serve the Lord. There's a whole lot to say about this, and we probably shouldn't get into it because, you know, I've already taken up too much time, but I'm going to do it anyway. The, the, the person that was the judge before Samuel, his name was Eli. He had two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas were not serving the Lord like they were supposed to. They were evil, wicked men. And then God raised up Samuel to take the place, to be the, the prophetic mouthpiece of the nation. 
And what we see here in this passage of Scripture is that Samuel's boys didn't serve the Lord like they were supposed to either. And I'm telling you that we see the same thing going on in society today. Husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, single moms are having a real difficult time being convinced that they're supposed to correct their children. I don't preach on this near enough, so I'm going to go ahead and get a little bit of tidbit in right now. It's your responsibility, parent. It's your responsibility to take control of your house. Your children do not know what's best for them. You have to lead and guide them. The Word of God wants you to lead and guide them in the truth. And the Word of God wants you to bring discipline into their lives. Amen. Don't think that I'm a mean preacher. The fact of the matter is, is that the Lord chastens those whom He loves. What does that mean? He brings correction into the lives of His own children. Listen, you can't be so short-sighted and think, oh, if I tell them something today, they're not going to like me. Well, hello? There's a lot of people that don't like me. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that won't like you if you tell them the truth. I told my boss one time, I don't like the fact what you just told me, man. Well, guess what? You can go find another job. And I realized after that that the Lord showed me, son, you got a problem with correction. I always have. I'm going to got a rebellious spirit in me. Lord, heal me. Amen? Nobody likes correction. That doesn't mean you don't correct them just because they don't like it. Amen? Is it okay to tell the truth? Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, Samuel's boys were the same. And it says right here in verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, your art, you are old, and your sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. So before this time, they didn't have a, judge, a king. They only had judges. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people. In other words, go ahead. Submit to the voice of the people, Samuel. In all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. See, God had a plan already in place. Oh, I know the Lord's speaking to me right now. God had a plan in place, but Israel refused to wait patiently on God's plan. And instead, they chose to grab a hold of their own plan. And when they did that, they demanded a king in their life. And when they demanded a king in their life, God gave them what they wanted. He gave them a man named Saul. But the truth of the matter is, is that God always had a plan to give them David. And he was already, at this point, David was in the sheep field, tending sheep. God was teaching him a softened heart towards the sheep, preparing him so he'd have a softened heart towards his people. Yeah. And yet the people the people cried out. And I want you to see that also in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 14 God's plan had to do with David and that whenever David was ready to die, the Lord told him right here in verse 13 actually verse 12, I'm sorry of 2 Samuel chapter 7 when your days be fulfilled David's on his deathbed right here when your days be fulfilled and you shall sleep with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, which shall, shall proceed out of your bowels, out of your insides, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. That was Solomon. This is a dual reference prophecy. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's talking about Jesus. Amen. See, David came from Judah, which the promise was given to the tribe of Judah. And Jesus ultimately came from Judah and through the house of David. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy, that he would have an everlasting kingdom. And the king of Israel represented the presence of the Lord because of this prophecy that was promised to them that there would be an eternal king that would rule upon the throne of Israel. And the prophet Jeremiah cries out and he wants to know, is not the king or is not the Lord in Zion, which is a hill that rests in Jerusalem and represents the place where the presence of God is. So here's God's people deported to Babylon and they begin to cry out. And Jeremiah, the prophet, asked the question, is is the Lord not still in Zion? Is the king not still on the throne? He's talking about the presence of God. In other words, even though chaos may be going on in your life, even though chaos may be going on upon the earth, the question that the prophet would ask you this morning is, but is God not still on the throne? Even though you might find yourself in captivity, even though you might find yourself in a place that you had no desire to be, the question still remains, is God still present and is he still able? Amen. And I got to tell you, 
that he is. Yes. Amen. He goes on to say, the next step is, is that why have they provoked me to anger? He says, why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? So the, the question is not whether or not God is present. The question is, has God's people lived their lives in such a way that they just don't feel his presence anymore? And he goes, we can, we can take a little bit of a, of a journey and we can go now to, to Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 10. And right now we're going to rest a little while on this concept about these graven images and these strange vanities. And I'm going to try to develop this thought for you a little bit to try to explain it a little bit better. Okay. It says in Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 10, therefore will I give their wives unto others. He's talking to the leaders right now. He's talking to the prophets and the priests. <laughs> He says, I will give their wives unto others and their fields to them that inherit them. For everyone from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, everyone deals falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. It's the same thing that's going on now. People are sitting in the church and they're hurting and they're in pain and the preacher stands behind the pulpit and says, everything's fine. Your life is just groovy. Everything's going good. All you got to do is say you're a child of God and you can have the best thing you ever thought that you'd have to. I can remember one time there was a young girl in the old church and she went to the preacher and she told the youth pastor, she said, things aren't right. I'm like, oh no, honey, you're fine. I'm trying to tell you that there's some things, oh no, honey, you're fine. Peace, peace. Mm. Peace, peace when there is no peace. No, you're not fine. Mm. If there's things in your life that are going on, you need to get a hold of the medicine that God has provided for you. Amen? Yeah. 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 Well, I going to say in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 4, Trust you not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. See, that's what they were doing. Oh, yeah, go ahead, grab your Bible. We're going to church. Everything's fine. Peace, peace. Temple of the Lord. I'm in church. I'm going to the church house. Everything's fine. And they think that because of their many doings and their goings in and out, and the fact that they're sitting in a pew of a church somewhere, that they've done their duty to God, and that everything's fine. No, the Lord said, don't believe lying words. Because this is the problem. In the temple of the Lord at this time, they're given to idolatry. Graven images are in the house of the Lord. Graven images and idolatry are in the midst of the house of the Lord. And what they're being told is that they're still serving God. Lying words. Now, I know that that sounds crazy to you. But do you realize what happens as a generation goes by? What I'm trying to explain to you is that if you were Samuel, and you were the prophet of God and you grew up in the temple of the Lord and you had been instructed by God in the ways of God and you knew what the word of God said. And all of a sudden, at about 17 years old, somebody tried to be, bring a graven image up in the house of God. You'd rip your clothes. You would rip your clothes and you would allow the word of God to bound out of your mouth. And you would say, what are you doing? You can't bring a graven image into the house of God. But just let it happen real slow. Yeah. Let it happen real slow. Don loop the gospel real slow. Just a little pinch here, a little pinch there. The next thing you know, Samuel gets old and he dies. And then the younger generation came up and guess what? A little graven image here. There's not going to hurt anything. A little bit of leaven in our doctrine is not going to hurt anything. It's still got a scripture in it. And they even say Jesus every now and then. It sounds like it's the right thing. But the reality of it is, is that as time goes on, as time goes on, they add a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that. They add a little something here, a little something there. And the fact of the matter is, is it's not end up to a situation where it's not even the gospel anymore. Amen. And the younger people that are coming up, they don't even know that it's not the gospel anymore. Yeah. And they embrace the ways of the world and the church. You don't have to, listen, let me be careful. I won't say it the wrong way. You, don't, you may not believe me when I tell you this, but the church, the modern church is embracing the ways of the world. They're tailoring their music and they're tailoring their stages to look like a concert. Yes. Because they want to appeal to the, to the flesh. It's called aesthetics. I mean, it looks good. It looks good to the eye. The light show, the, the, the talented musicians, 
It's an entertainment factor. People want to be entertained today. And, and you know what? They want the pastor to look cool. They want him to be young and groovy and cool. And they want him to be funny. And they want to, when I leave out of here, I want, I want things, I want to feel good. Because look, I got, I'm going to have a rough week coming up. Well, again, welcome to the club. We all got a rough week coming up. Because we're in a war. Amen. We're in the midst of a battle. If we're really in the battle. Amen. Come on. Amen. And, and so that's what we do is, is that now we're in an entertainment show. And we're mixing things together. We're taking up the world and we're mixing it with the church. And as each generation goes by, we don't know any better. You end up showing up in a youth group today. Let me tell you what happened back in the 1970s. Uh, a prophet of God named David Wilkerson was invited to a to a concert, a Christian concert. And he went into that Christian concert. He's a man of God. You can say what you want about David Wilkerson. You can call him old school if you want, but he was in the cornfields of Iowa. I believe it was Iowa. And the Lord called him to New York City. And he was on the streets of New York City witnessing the prostitutes and gang members. And he started Times Square Church. And it's got thousands of members in it now. And he just recently died. Yes. And so David Wilkerson... He is invited to this, this Christian concert and he walks in there and what he, he says all of a sudden as they began to play I could see in the spiritual realm demon spirits coming out of the speakers and I began to scream at the top of my lungs Ichabod! Ichabod! What is Ichabod? Ichabod was one of Hoff, either Hophni or Phineas, Phineas his wife was, was pregnant. Remember how I just mentioned Hophni and Phineas, the, the, the sons of Eli? One of their wives was pregnant when they died. And when she heard the news, she gave birth to the child and she named him Ichabod. The meaning, the glory of the Lord has departed the house. Meaning the presence of God has now left the yes. building. And whenever David Wilkerson started to scream Ichabod, he said, they all looked at me as though I had gone mad. They all looked at me as though I were crazy. That was back in the 1970s. And he wrote an article. He said, whatever you do, church, don't let it come in. Don't let this music of the world come into the church because it's not the way that it's supposed to be. It's the world system and it's the ways of the world. And now we can't even tell the difference anymore. Does the music preach the gospel? What I'm trying to tell you is, is that we're talking about graven images and we're talking about strange vanities. We're talking about emptiness. We're talking about one thing calling itself God when in reality, maybe it's not God after all. Right. Amen. And it goes on to say right here in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 4 that they were walking once again into the temple and they, they were going to church. I wanted to turn with you real quick, or you don't have to turn, but I'm going to tell you about Jonah. Because Jonah used this same terminology, graven images or, or vanities. This is after Jonah is on that boat and he's in disobedience to the Lord. Jonah's on this boat. You know, two things in this message the Lord dealt with me about the hearts of a sinner. We got to be careful that we don't get so prideful and so full of self-righteousness that we don't forget where we were. Amen. Amen. Help us, Lord. Help me. Amen. Amen. Jonah had a problem. He had a problem with the fact that God was sending him to preach to sinners. And he didn't want to, he didn't want to do the job. And in disobedience, he ended up on that boat. And when the storm came, they ultimately found out he was the problem and they threw him in the water. Yes. Jonah wrote a song later as he was sinking down in the depths of the ocean. And this was his song. I went down to the bottoms. This is verse 6 of Jonah chapter 2. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. His prayer was directed towards the holy temple. What does that mean to you? We spent four weeks on the prophet Elijah. We talked about the temple of God. What did we say about the temple of God? In the temple of God, there was a holy place and beyond the veil, there was the holy of holies and beyond that veil in the holy of holies, there was a box called the Ark of the Covenant that had the law of God that had a mercy seat with two angels where the blood was applied and God said, right there, I'm going to meet with you. So when Jonah says, I turn my eyes toward the temple of the Lord, he was trying to find his direction as he's sinking down in the ocean. What he's saying is, I put my He says, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Yes. 
He's talking about people that look to idols. He's talking about people that, even though they don't know it, are in the midst of false doctrine. They don't really know how to hold on to the real Lord. Because they're not being taught proper instruction of the ways of God. They don't understand that Jesus is the access in the doorway. Yeah, they understand it for salvation. But I'm talking about as their daily journey yes. upon this earth. Jonah said, they that look to lying vanities. Those, I'm telling you right now, the preacher's telling you right now. Those that are caught up in a false doctrine <clears throat> forsake their owners. Goes on to say, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. Amen. So even Jonah can see in this situation that, that you know what? <laughs> Lying vanities in a false way is not going to accomplish what God is wanting to do in the lives of his people. Listen, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. This is just another way to say the same thing. The temple of God is filled with graven images, filled with empty gods. There's a false doctrine that's being preached. The people of God think that they're serving God, but the reality of it is, is that they're not serving God at all. And it goes on to say right here in chapter 2, verse 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, Broken, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They've committed two evils against me. Number one, I'm over here wanting to offer them living water. Like I'm wanting to be a fountain of life in the midst of their life. I'm wanting them to be able to draw from me and whenever they find themselves dry, parched, or thirsty, that they look to me and they call on me and I meet their needs and I give them to drink. But instead they chose with the works of their own hands to build themselves a cistern so they can hold their own water. And it's not just a regular old cistern, it's a broken cistern. It's got holes and cracks in it. And it's leaking. It can't hold any water. Amen. And what I'm here to tell you is this, is that in the modern church, the same thing is going on. The church is, it has chosen to dig their own cisterns and they're broken cisterns that are leaking and can't hold any water. I've told it to you before, but I'm going to tell it to you again. Churches across the land, and listen to me, this is a trickle-down effect, and you can think it's an accident if you want to. I'm not that naive. I believe it's a purposeful plan. Amen. And what I'm telling you is the word of God says in the book of Revelation in the end there's a dragon and he's got frogs coming out of his mouth and they're lying spirits and they deceive the masses. Yes. And in big ministries in America, what they've done is, and I told you all about this a few weeks ago, they've come up with a test and it's like a psychological test. If you've been to some of these big churches, you might have experienced this. Because whenever you decide to get involved in their ministries, they usually put you in a class. But yeah, they make you take a test. And in the test, you fill out these little, and it basically it's a psychological questionnaire. They find out tendencies of your behavior and your personality. And they find out where you would fit best in the midst of what they're doing. And so they say, oh, you're gifted in the area of working with children. Or you're gifted in the area of being on the worship team or the choir. Or you're gifted in this area and you're gifted in that area because what they've learned in church growth movement is that people need to be connected. People want to be connected in smaller groups because they want to feel welcome and they want to feel like they have a purpose and they want to feel like they have like a smaller community that they can be involved in. And so it's part of a retention method. We're going to retain the people. There's people that are seeking for something. We're going to bring them in. And we're going to have a program planned for them. And we're going to retain them by sticking them in. And we're going to find out where they fit. And that's where we're going to put them. Well, the problem with that is, is that it's not scriptural. The scripture says that the Holy Spirit is the one that dispenses gifts. Amen. The Holy Spirit says that if you would seek the face of God, he would show you what he desires to do through you and in you. And he would begin to move upon your heart. And listen, you don't even have to always do it inside the walls of the church. Amen. Sometimes you might feel led 
to go down the street and to hand a bottle of water to somebody and say, hey, I just want to let you know something. Jesus changed my life. Amen. Jesus Amen. changed my life and he'll do the same for you. Amen. And guess what? The Lord can move and operate through that. And the more that you do it, the better you'll get at it and the more you'll be used by God. Hallelujah. He might bring it to your work spot and you might say, oh, preacher, I'm not supposed to talk about Jesus at work. I understand that. I understand we live in the midst of a society now that doesn't want you to, but if somebody brings something up, if they see you living for Jesus, I know I'm a little bit different than some of y'all, but it's okay. If they see you living for Jesus and you're going through things in the midst of your life and you don't seem to be operating with a broken cistern that's losing its water and they need to get some of that living water. They need that fountain flowing on the inside of them and they begin to ask you a question. They may ask you, hey, where do you draw your strength from? Where tell you, I was really messed up. Amen. And the Lord showed up and he did something in the midst of my life. Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now. And yet, yet the, the modern church, they got different ways and different ploys and techniques. And once again, they've done this psychology thing. They brought the psychology and the psychological counselor. They mix it with scripture. But the focal point isn't on Jesus. Oh, yeah, I know they got scripture in there. I'm, listen to me. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not dumb. I know that. I, I've been involved in it. You need victory in your life. Come to our over overcomers class. Because in overcomers, you're going to get your victory. No, you're not. Because let me tell you why. Because the teacher, had, basically they've taken the ploys of the program and they've implemented it in the church and they put some scripture on it. And they're not teaching you how to keep your faith in the finished work of Christ, which gives you access to the grace of God, which empowers you and causes the chains of addiction to be broken in your life. So whatever it is you're dealing with, whatever it is you're going through, if the program hadn't done it for you, if all the little things that they set up for you over there, well, maybe it's just we need to try Jesus. <laughs> maybe we need to go old school, Ballard, the old rugged cross. Maybe we need to go old school, heaven on my mind. Old school, lift Jesus higher. Remember that he died on the cross. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord. Or a works-based message. <laughs> I was talking to a brother at any time fitness yesterday morning. Started talking to him about the gospel. Listen, people over here, and they're digging cisterns. And they've been taught for the last 30 years. The preacher stands behind the pulpit and he preaches an all-to message with a how-to ending. What you talking about? Well, you ought to live this way. You ought to live this way, this way, this way, this way. And you ought not do that no more. And here I am sitting in the audience thinking to myself, how do I do that, preacher? And his answer was, well, come up here to the altar. I'm going to lay my hands on you. You're going to fall down and you're going to get up better. <laughs> you know how many times I went up to the altar and fell down and he got up and I wasn't no better? Amen. You don't want me to say that, huh? <laughs> oh, you shouldn't say that. No, I'm going to check. Is it okay if I tell you the truth? Amen. Amen. How many times did you fall down and get back up and you wasn't no better? Amen. Because that's not the answer. If it was just touch somebody on the head, let them fall down and get back, then Jesus would not have to die on the cross. Amen. I'm not saying God doesn't ever touch people and that they won't fall down under the power of God and that they can't be blessed and that he can't do a work on them while they're down there and that from time to time you don't see somebody get up and there's a change in their life. That's not what I'm saying. Time out. Bring balance to your message, preacher. I believe in the power of God. I believe in the hand of God touching somebody. Yes. But what I'm trying to say is, is that it's not about writing down. I told y'all about this a while back. Write down your sin, throw it on a piece of paper on the floor and step on it. Or you just need to pray more, Christian. You need to pray more. You need to go to church more. You need to read more. You need to witness more. That was one of the teachings that I used to hear all the time. If you'll do those four things, you're going to walk in victory. So now you, what you've done is just as they have put man's eyes in the church on the overcomers meeting or on the ministry that they're in instead of Jesus. Now you've put my eyes on my performance. Right. Lying, 
vanities, graven images, another gospel, another Jesus, void of power. No power flowing. That's why they're doing that, because they moved away from the truth on teaching people how to walk with God. And so therefore, they have to come up with an alternate plan. And it gives people something to do. Do you realize that most people really want that anyway? I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. Most people want that anyway. They want a workbook. They want a workbook with blanks in it. And I'm not opposed to workbooks with blanks. That's not what I'm saying. As long as the blank that you're filling in tells you the truth. Yeah. You understand what I'm getting at? They want a workbook with blanks because they can hold it. They can hold it in their hand. They can flip through the pages. It's something that they can hold. They can, they can look at it. They can touch it. It's physical. But the covenant is spiritual. The plan of God is a spiritual miracle. Amen. The plan of God is the giving of the darling of heaven, his precious son, to die on the cross, and a shift taking place in the heavenly realm. As a matter of fact, I want to I want to talk to you about that real quick. It says, you know, we're not even going to turn there. I'm just going to tell you about it. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. I want to tell you about the plan. It's not about adding psychology to theology. It's not about digging your own cistern in the works of your own hands that leaks. But instead, it's about the plan of God, and this is the plan of God. In Romans chapter 5, the word gift is used five times. You know what that gift finally is, we're told in verse 17? Righteousness. Righteousness. How did, what is righteousness? Jesus. Jesus. There was an exchange that took place at the cross. Did you know that? The exchange that took place is that Jesus took your guilt, and when you put your faith in him... He allowed his righteousness to be given to you. Amen. And now that you've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ, you've been exposed, clothed and now exposed to the presence of God. And the presence of God is the one that's moving and operating through the person of the Holy Spirit, dispensing grace into your life. Amen. As a matter of fact, that's what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Therefore, being justified by faith. What does the word justified mean? It means a declaration of innocence. God spoke no longer guilty in your life. Amen. Why? Because you chose to take your faith and put it in his plan. Amen. Jesus. Amen. The word justification and righteousness only have like a couple of letters different in the, in the Greek language. One is a standing in the eyes of God, righteousness. The other one is a declaration from the mouth of God, righteousness. Because you put your faith in Christ, you were clothed with Him. And now that you've been clothed with Him, the Father sees you that way and He says, righteous. And now that you're righteous, you have access to the grace of God. It's the working and operating of the Holy Spirit in your life that's doing it. Not graven images and not empty vanity, lying vanities. Amen. Not some plan of the modern church that's going to fix you up on the outside. No, you need to get a hold of real Jesus that's going, Jesus on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. I wish I would have known what that song was saying way back when. I know that it would have saved me a whole lot of trouble. Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 8. We got to, I hadn't even got to the main point of my message. I need to hustle up. Verse 21, for the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. So the prophet Jeremiah is crying out. He says, for the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. He's speaking forth the heart of God. He said, I'm black. It's not talking about the color of his skin. It's talking about that he's repenting in sackcloth and ashes. The Jewish man, I mean, his skin was probably darker than ours, but the Jewish man would put, whenever he was going to repent, he would put sackcloth on his body, like a whole burlap sack because it was uncomfortable. And he would take ashes and he would spread it all over his body because he wanted to be uncomfortable because true repentance has some pain connected to it. Amen. Amen. Lord, help us. We've transgressed your ways. And, 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 and I, I'm hurting because of the heart of my people. That's a true prophet of God. Look down at verse 1 of chapter 9. True prophet of God hurts for the souls of the sinners and hurts for the children of God whenever they find themselves wayward. Jeremiah says, oh, that my head were waters. He wishes that his head was like a lake full of water. And that my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the, for the slain of the daughter of my people. That's why they called him the weeping prophet. That's what we need today. I'm preaching to myself. We need preachers that would weep. That would weep for the lost. Weep for souls. Because that's what's going on on this earth today. If the story is real, this is not a game. 
Right. Souls hang in the balance. Come on. Yes. Lord, help us. This is the point that I really wanted to get to this morning. This last part of the scripture where it says, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? It, the balm of Gilead, this is, this is Gilead right here. Now, I know that I've, I've, I've drawn a lot of maps for you. But as you look there, I'm going to try to get, you can see this little area right here that's on that map. That's Mount Carmel. I told you all that's where Elijah had to show down the prophets of Baal. And this is the Sea of Galilee that you see up there. And this is the Dead Sea. And this area right here between the two is what Israel was. So on this side of the Jordan River, a little bit north of the Sea of Galilee, was a place called Gilead. And in Gilead, it is said that there was a certain kind of tree that grew. And this tree was, it was a form of a balsam tree. And this tree, especially during the summer months, its branches would be red. And it would exude a particular type of resin. This is actually a bud of the balm of Gilead. And, and so the, during certain times it would produce a bud. And if you squeeze it, that's the resin that would come out. It was a reddish color. And, but really during the summer, the purest form of it, it would really begin to exude a resin. A, it would begin to leak out a reddish colored resin out of the branches itself. And the hotter it was and the more humid it was, the more that resin would exude. And then when they would really get the high quality stuff, they would slice the branches with a knife. Just as our Savior's back was split open by the lictor's lash, by that whip of the Roman soldier, and it began to exude that most precious commodity that the world has ever known, the blood of the sinless one, in a similar fashion, this tree, when it was sliced, would begin to exude this red resin. That was found and made to make medicinal, for medicinal purposes that, that was so well known across the country. And here's just another little picture of what the resin would have looked like. But listen, we hear stories of the balm of Gilead. As a matter of fact, this is a picture of the story of Joseph. You remember Joseph in the coat of many colors and how his brothers deceived him? And then what happened was is that they had thrown him in a pit and they didn't know, really know what to do with him. And all of a sudden a caravan of what they called Ishmaelites came traveling through. And in that scripture it says, on that scripture, and they sat down to eat. That's talking about Joseph's brother's bread. They lifted up their eyes and looked and behold a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels. Bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. This was the balm of Gilead that they had. The balm of Gilead was not only not only was it spoken of here, but it was also spoken of. This is a picture uh, depicting the queen of Sheba coming to Solomon. You've heard of King Solomon before and how wise he was and how the queen of Sheba had heard about it. She had heard in her land that there was a king in Israel that was more wise than any man. And she just said, she said, I got to go see this man. And, I, and she went to sit at his feet to hear his words and what she brought with her. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with the hard questions <coughs> with camels that bear spices and other gifts. That word spices in the original Hebrew language speaks once again of the balm of Gilead. And this balm, it is said, could heal various things. It could heal respiratory ailments. It could heal urinary, heal urinary ailments. It could heal gastrointestinal ailments. It could heal inflammatory ailments. It could heal. So it got so famous, the balm of Gilead, that it came to the point where there was nothing that the balm of Gilead couldn't cure. And so what we see in this particular situation having to do with Jeremiah, that's my, one of some of my last points. Just hold on a second. We're getting close to the end. What it had to do with what Jeremiah was talking about was is that he looked at the condition of his people. He looked at the condition of the fact that they had been deported to Babylon. He looked at the condition of the sin that was in their lives. He looked at the condition of everything that was going on and he cries from the bottom of his heart and he says, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician left? The idea is, is that they did the resin stop flowing from the tree? Is there nobody that can bring the bone to those that are hurting and sickened and in need of healing? Is there no physician that can dispense the medicine? I got good news for you, Jeremiah, because the word of the Lord says different. You might not have known it then. And yes, that physical balm couldn't have healed the spiritual condition of Israel. But what you spoke out of your mouth on that day was a prophetic utterance 
that told us of a day that God was going to send another physician. Hallelujah. Another physician and another ball that could bring healing to the hurting soul. And he said in Mark chapter 2, he said, the righteous don't need a physician. I come for the sick. Jesus came for the sick because you see, if you did your righteous, you don't need Jesus. Uh -huh. He's a physician that's come for the sick. Amen. I don't know what you got going on in your life right now. I don't know how sick you are. I don't know if you find yourself like Jonah sinking to the bottom of the ocean. But I'm here to tell you that there is a physician in the land. And not only that, I'm going to turn to this one. 1 Peter chapter 2. Mm -hmm. There's also a tree that was striped. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you as sheep were going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. We always preach that scripture as the stripes and the physical healing of Jesus. Yeah. I got good news for you. There's physical healing in Jesus. Amen? Amen. But if you look at the context, I didn't make it up. It's right there. For you as sheep were going astray. But now you're returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Mankind was going astray. God had a plan. God had a plan to send a physician. God had a plan to send a lamb. <coughs> and through those stripes and through that cross and the payment of the penalty, he provided a way. He provided access to bring the sheep back. And when the sheep come back to the physician... And when they apply that balm of Gilead in the hurt and the pain and the illness of their life, healing takes place. 